This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Also, make sure to check out and subscribe to our YouTube original channel, UCTV Prime, available only on YouTube. Welcome, I'm Steve Corral, the Dean of the Graduate School of Management at the University of California at Davis. And I'm here today with Amy Jaffe, one of the world's leading uh, energy industry uh, experts. Uh, Amy recently joined uh, UC Davis as the Executive Director of Energy and Sustainability with joint appointments in the Graduate School of Management and the Institute for Transportation Studies. Previously, Amy was at Rice University in Houston, where she was affiliated with the James A. Baker III Institute for Public Policy. She held the Wallace S. Wilson Fellowship in Energy Studies and was director of the Energy Forum at Rice University. Amy's activities here at UC Davis will include executive education, uh, research support on energy, and today we're going to talk about a number of her interests and areas of expertise. So Amy, welcome to UC Davis. We're thrilled to have you here, and I'd like to know a little bit more today about your uh, interests in, in the energy industry, geopolitical issues, and tell us a bit, a bit about the activities you'll be involved with here at Davis. Well, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, Davis is a world leader in energy and sustainability. Um, I'm very excited to be able to work uh, in the West Village, which is going to be this really uh, phenomenal uh, test bed for the kinds of new technologies we're going to need as we move forward. And it's a very exciting time to be looking at energy. Uh, we're having great transformation, even in the oil and gas sector, with new technology and what it's brought for uh, the development of resources from the shale formations, which is really revolutionizing uh, with the way we think about uh, ourselves as an oil importer here in the United States. Uh, but it's also a very pivotal time from the point of view of climate change and other priorities, bringing on new technologies, cleaner energy sources, and at a time when the Middle East is in turmoil. And we're going to not only need those new energy sources because we want to preserve the planet, but we are going to need them just to be able to go about our daily life, that we really are going to get to the point, I think, where it's going to become harder and harder uh, to rely on resources that would find their way from the Middle East here to the United States. So you've had a lot of experience in working with large uh, traditional oil and gas companies. And so one of the questions I'm interested in is, is your, I'm interested in your thoughts about their transition from traditional oil and gas uh, production and refining to um, a, bi a bigger emphasis on renewables. Do, do they have the research and development and innovation infrastructure to accomplish that? And are, are they going to be nimble enough or are they going to be affected by organizational inertia that will prevent them from making those transitions? Well, it's a very, very interesting challenge. You know, some people say, well, listen, it's not like the railroad companies went out and realized that air travel was going to be the big mode of transportation going forward. And so therefore, they switched and started going into the plane mm -hmm. manufacturing mm -hmm. and plane transportation. Mm -hmm. um, but on the other hand, uh, even these giant oil companies uh, are companies of engineers and geoscientists and scientists. Um, and they also have you know, a stock of people who are you know, MBAs, like from uh, schools like the GSM. And the question is, how as a large organization can you tap the entrepreneurial spirit uh, of startups? And I think that is going to be a very big challenge for the industry. Uh, I think there's interest in it. Uh, with things like the low carbon fuel standard here in California, you're seeing companies like BP and Chevron trying to think about how to bring cleaner fuels into their portfolio. And, and also the companies are very much responding to this possibility that we might have ample natural gas in the United States. So you see big players, BP, Shell, uh, moving into what we call liquefied natural gas, so LNG, but for the trucking industry. And you've got big players like UPS 
who are moving to that as sort of a, a, a cleaner, perhaps less expensive fuel uh, than traditional mm -hmm. diesel fuel and so forth. So it's really kind of an interesting time mm -hmm. to see what technologies might win, um, what business strategies can work. You've got companies like GE that are now trying to set up business plan competitions within their energy division to come up with new products to come forward. So people are trying innovative, interesting things, even though they're large corporations and are very hard to, uh, to be like a Silicon Valley startup. Mm -hmm. So there's uh, a lot of uh, attention nowadays from consumers and the pain at the pump and the instability in gasoline prices. So what are your thoughts about uh, factors that might stabilize supply and demand and ultimately prices or may destabilize prices? Well, California has a big challenge. California is what we call an isolated market. It's as if the state's an island because of the Clean Air Act and the mandates for clean air, which are highly important and so not something we can just waive. Um, we have a different specification of gasoline uh, than, than our neighboring states. And so really, we have to manufacture what we need here in California, or we have to rely on, uh, to the extent that we can take an imported barrel, somebody's going to have to take it and add blending stock uh, to make it to the proper specification for California. So that makes it very difficult for us. Anything goes wrong, refinery explosion, um, too many refineries have maintenance in the same period, um, something changes very dramatically, um, in, in, in a pipeline goes down. Mm -hmm. It means that consumers feel the pain at the pump immediately. So, but there are some things that can be done on a policy basis that frankly probably should need to be done nationally. Mm -hmm. Uh, but also could be done in the state, which is in other countries, Japan, uh, among the EU countries, South Korea. Uh, actually, industry is required to hold minimum inventories. There's a level at which uh, you're not allowed to bring your inventories down. And, uh, and, and inventory plays a very important role in stabilizing supply when you have unexpected disruptions in your supply chain. Um, and also, probably there are some things one can look at uh, as, a, as companies in terms of uh, updating the technology for, for supply chain management and so forth. So I don't think that we as Californians should just accept the fact that because we have higher environmental standards that somehow means we have to have a more disrupted market. Mm -hmm. And we should probably lobby um, that other, uh, that in the United States federally, it would be important to have many states have the highest environmental standards for fuels. And that way, it would make the fuel system more fungible. It's not, not necessary to have different fuel standards for cities with air quality problems in Texas or in New York or Boston uh, from California. At some point, uh, probably a consolidation of standards. Uh, I think there's something like 50 or 60 grades of gasoline uh, that are marketed all across the United States, and that's probably too many. So I'm interested in, in what your thoughts are about the political factors that may make it more difficult to get that kind of standardization. Well, you know, what happens is, and that's the difficult thing we have in gasoline, so you had many urban areas that needed to have a higher quality of gasoline, but much cleaner fuel, and, and they were the high population places, you know, Texas, California, mm -hmm. Florida, New York, mm -hmm. and then you've got people out of Montana. And they say, well, I, I don't want to pay more for gasoline, and we don't have any air pollution out here in Montana, so you know, we, we are not going to go in for that whole Clean Air Act thing. And because their city is not, Billings or wherever, is not out of compliance with the clean air mm -hmm. standards of the EPA, they can have a lower, lower grade of gasoline. So it's an equity issue. Like, we could have one standard of gasoline for the whole country, but it would have to be at the highest standard for air pollution for for the right. non-attainment areas, yeah. right? So the politics of that was, you know, people said, well, okay, for those places like Los Angeles that are in non-attainment, they should have to pay up for this higher quality gasoline, but, you know, we in Alabama and we in Montana, we don't have to pay for that. But what it's done is it's created this crazy system where we have, you know, 50 or 60 different kinds of gasoline that are sold around the United States and what it means is, is that if something goes wrong in one part of the country, you can't bring gasoline in from another part of the country. 
Um, and that's a cost, and it's a cost really in the end to everyone. So in a recent National Public Radio interview, you discussed the global oil markets and you drew an analogy to swimmers in a swimming pool. Can you say a little bit more about that? Okay, so the big thing in the presidential debates is that we can get to energy independence. So first of all, what do we mean by that? We mean that we could produce the amount of energy we need, uh, you know, not just renewables, but, but like oil and gas that we need here in the United States and not have to buy imported oil from the Middle East. And one can see with new technologies for drilling from source rock that we could actually get there. But that doesn't necessarily mean that if there's a disruption in the Middle East or something else happens that raises the price of oil, that we in the United States will necessarily see the lower price. And that is because it's a global market. And so it's one price for all. So the analogy to the swimming pool is, if I, we're all having a lovely Sunday and we're all in the pool and someone takes a bucket and they start pulling water out of the pool, it affects the person in the deep end the same amount as the person in the shallow end. It's less water for the whole pool. And the same way, if you pour more water in, uh, it affects the whole pool. It, does, it affects everybody equally. It doesn't affect people in the shallow or the deep end differently. So that's what we really have to understand. But it doesn't mean that having more energy produced here in the United States wouldn't help us. And the reason it would help us has to do with our trade balance and, and, and the strength of the dollar and other positive things that would come about if we kept the revenue from our energy use here in our own country and we were not shipping our dollars uh, to Saudi Arabia, to Russia, or other countries like that. Um, if we were paying someone who's producing oil in Texas or Pennsylvania or with the new oil, maybe even Ohio, Florida, or California, then that money stays in the U.S. economy, and, um, and, and it, it is a better, we would be able to wind down our current account deficit over time. So maybe that's a good uh, transition to my next question, and it was about your recent book uh, entitled Oil, Dollars, Debt, and Crises, The Global Curse of Black Gold, which is a very intriguing and provocative title. So tell us a little bit more about the, uh, the market dynamics and the kind of boom and bust activity that you've seen in this market and, and, and this dynamic of, of the role of the banks, currency valuations, energy price crises, and so on. So say a little bit more about that dynamic. Well, so we have this dynamic where we're, say we're having a good economy, we're having a lot of growth, China's having a lot of growth. Right, so oil demand goes up because it you know, takes more energy, uh, the more economic activity you have. And as the price goes up, there's a lag between the time it takes an oil company or, or, or producer to go out and drill for that oil and then bring it to market. Right. So the price keeps going higher, right? The higher the price goes, now we're importing a lot of oil, so we're sending that money out to a Saudi Arabia or Venezuela or a country like that. And uh, especially with the countries in the Middle East, they have small populations. Um, they're not manufacturing-based economies. So you're pouring billions and billions, hundreds of billions of dollars into an economy instantly as the price is going up. And yes. they can't absorb that money. So they put it in a sovereign wealth fund. And then the money has to come back out into the international financial system. So your pension manager is recommending a stock. But so is the pension manager for the money manager for Saudi Arabia's you know, sovereign wealth fund. So you have to imagine it like uh, uh, you're at an auction and there's one guy who wants to bid for painting. OK, painting goes for a certain price. But if there's 100 people chasing the same painting, you get an inflation. You get what we call in financial terms a bubble. Mm -hmm. You get this giant financial bubble. And we saw this in 2007. The bubble was in real estate. The bubble was in London real estate. You had the Arab money coming into certain financial derivative products. Um, and so what happened is the bubble gets so big that it pops. And the next thing we know, we're in a financial crisis. Um, and, and you know the low interest rates aggravated at this time. So it was a, a very difficult thing. People lose their jobs. Um, and then as people lose their jobs and businesses can't move forward because of the financial crisis, that lowers oil demand. And so oil prices fall, which we saw in 2008, 2009. So you have this boom-bust cycle. 
And really the best way to ameliorate it is to have a steady program in alternative energy to try to you know, improve energy efficiency, which is something we work on very strongly here at UC Davis. It's a critical element to sort of getting us out of this boom bust cycle where we suddenly have an oil crisis, we are all paying too much at the pump, the next thing you know we're in a recession, oil prices fall. Um, we really want to be in a more level uh, situation and energy efficiency detaching our economic activity from the amount of rising amount of oil that we need to do it is a critical part of sort of getting out of this cycle we've been seeing since the 1970s. So let's, let's come back to this uh, theme of energy independence. And in, in, um, in the minds of many political leaders, this has been a very uh, uh, salient and important issue, a high priority. Uh, there's been increasing investment into renewables and alternative energies and so on, but in some uh, circles, uh, a lack of enthusiasm and a lack of support for support of traditional uh, oil and gas projects. Take the Keystone Pipeline, for example. So what, what are your thoughts about what's going on there politically, and also what are the implications for a project like that for the U.S.? Well, you know, I tell people we have to be realistic, right? And I, I strongly believe that we need to move to alternative energy. And we need to make the investment to do that. And that means we need to have strong government support for fundamental science and R&D in these important technologies. We need projects like the West Village Project where we are deploying those technologies in a real-time incubator so we can get them you know, commercialized right, and proven. Um, but the flip side is, in the meantime, we have in this country 350 million vehicles on the road that run on liquid fuel. And we can block the development of a pipeline, or we can block the development of oil and gas resources because we feel that's dirty energy, right? But who are we hurting? I mean, in the end, if you're not willing to get out of your car, of course, it's easy to say, easy, if everybody could live like the Davis campus on a bicycle, well, that'd be great, right? Then we could be out of our cars, and then we wouldn't need so much oil and gas infrastructure. Um, but realistically, many cities in the United States today, that's not possible. People don't live in the same climate, uh, and so they, they have different constraints. And so what we have to do is have a thoughtful transition where we're making sure that we have enough supply for our immediate needs, but we are taking steps in policy to make sure that over time those immediate needs fall and that we're diversified with the different fuels. So it's, it's like managing a portfolio. It's, it's managing a more diverse portfolio of sources of energy, and that makes us less reliant on any one single source. That, that that's correct. And if you, if you look at, um, you know, people say, well, you know, people always focus, politicians always focus on, you know, the insecure nature of oil from the Middle East. And, you know, it's certainly looking very insecure today with the Arab mm -hmm. Spring. But if you look at Japan, I mean, they had this terrible accident at Fukushima, right, as, as part of the tsunami, very unexpected, very black swan. Uh, but now they're having to reorganize their entire energy system. And it's affecting companies as broadly as Toyota, which was about to launch a dual fuel plug-in car in Japan. And of course, now there's these terrible electricity shortages. So it even affects the future strategy of a car company. So, but, but the good news for the average Japanese is if they only had nuclear power and they didn't actually use other things for fuel, they didn't have uh, uh, LNG natural gas and they didn't have renewables and they didn't have uh, some, some oil burning power plants and so forth, and they had to bring down all their nuclear plants for safety reasons, and people would be sitting in the dark. So we have to have a diversified profile and you know we're just now really seeing the possibilities with new technology of having a diversified portfolio in transportation fuel. And that was the exciting thing for me to come here to UC Davis. You know, we are the leaders in this area, thinking about the policy that goes with that, thinking about the technology that goes with that. And this is something we must do. We must do it because we're not really going to be able to rely on some of the foreign sources for oil that we have in the past. And we must do it because we know we have to protect the environment and this is the best way to do it, is to diversify our transportation system. And, and, and Californians know it better than anybody else. We, we know what the consequences of using fuels that pollute the air. 
We, we can see the consequences of, of climate change in terms of, of sustainable agriculture and other kinds of things where we know what the risks are. Very interesting. Can I just go back for a moment to the uh, Fukushima tragedy? And I'm just curious about what your thoughts were about um, the recent decisions by the Germans to pull back from their emphasis on nuclear power. It was, was, was that a reaction to Fukushima and was that an overreaction on, the, on their part? It seemed to me to be quite a large swing in their uh, energy policy. It's very challenging, I think, in the energy policy space not to overreact. Um, because, you know, energy production is industrial, right? So whether it's the Fukushima accident or the Macondo spill in the US Gulf of Mexico, when we're confronted with a temporary failure in a technology, whether it's because of a natural disaster or because of human error, you know, the impetus, the, the knee-jerk reaction is to say, we shouldn't use that technology anymore. That's too frightening. We, we don't want to have the risk of that technology, right? And, and so you get things like you have an, a million and a one-shot accident in Japan, and it causes some people as far away as Germany uh, uh, to close off their nuclear program, right? Because people who live near plants begin, become fearful. What if that happened here? But the problem with that approach is that life is not risk-free. And if you look at the energy production, any kind of energy production, there are risks that are associated with it. Even the energy we all like, wind, you know, it provides a lot of ecological risk, right? So, so we, we have to actually step back from that. And that, I think, is a great thing that we can do at the Graduate School of Management with energy companies, which is to help them understand how, how do I run my business so I lower the chances that um, I'm going to have a catastrophic accident or I lower my chances that my business will be affected by one of these incredible black swan risks mm -hmm. that could happen from external factors like natural disasters or wars, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's a business challenge, right? I mean, we don't want to just abandon a, 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 a successful technology because human beings can't manage it as a business. We want to be teaching people how to mitigate risk through smart business operations. And you know, that's part of the role of the business school, mm -hmm. right? It's why we do executive education. I mean, obviously our first, uh, first line of defense is to you know, take people who are going for their MBA or undergraduate studying business and, and educate them and they go out into the world. Um, but risks change over time. And because the risks are changing, uh, it means you need executive education. So one of the things that companies mm -hmm. are going to have to really start to deal with are the risks associated with climate change, right? Nobody's really got, really wrapped their brain around, uh, I'll give you a key example. The entire refining industry of the world and petrochemical industry is on the coast, 90% or 80%, I mean, I forget what the percentage is, but a huge portion of our petrochemical and refining industry, not just here in the United States, but in China and other places, are coastal. And they're places that are going to be affected by sea level rise. And we saw that during Hurricane Katrina, where these refineries were damaged by the storm. Well, I can assure you, the refining industry hasn't even thought about that. They have no plan. They don't know what they're going to do. They don't know what, that would, would, what they're going to do over time, right? So that's that's something that needs to be addressed. It's a risk that's changing. Same thing with cyber, right? So we all know about getting a, a, a virus in our personal computer and how devastating that can be to our personal lifestyle for three or four days or maybe even more prolonged if you don't have a good IT consultant, right? But that is happening in warfare in the oil industry in the Middle East. Uh, people, I'll say, countries, Maybe the United States was involved, attacked the oil industry of Iran with a cyber virus. We, first we attacked their nuclear program, and then we spread it to their oil industry. Very successful, right? Everybody, you know, is patting each other on the back until the Iranians analyzed that virus and then put it into the oil industry of Saudi Arabia. And fortunately for us as drivers, um, the virus only got as far as Saudi Aramco, the national oil companies, office operations, 
But had the virus spread to the computer system that controls their oil production, you and I would have been in gasoline lines. So who in the world, your Exxon Mobil or, or, or Shell, I mean, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, you're really sitting around thinking about cybersecurity as a risk to your production? Probably not. Are you thinking about it today? Yes, every minute of the day. So last year we hosted here at UC Davis uh, a talk by Amory Levins of the Rocky Mountain Institute. And he said some provocative things. For example, he said that um, the U.S. could end its reliance on fossil fuels and the U.S. economy could grow its economy by nearly 160 percent while eliminating the need for oil, gas, nuclear, and one-third of the national, natural gas, and that we would save $5 trillion on the net present value cost in this process. Are those figures realistic, or is he looking through rose-colored glasses? Well, you know, I like to sometimes do an exercise where I like to make people take energy units and make it all comparable. Right, so we have 103 nuclear plants in the United States. To convert that um, to renewable energy, you're talking about a huge amount of final power. So the global numbers, to give you an idea, suppose we wanted to take um, all of the fossil fuels that are used globally, and we want to convert it to renewable energy. That would be the equivalent of building over 6,000 nuclear plants worldwide. Mm -hmm. Um, it's 14 times the number of nuclear plants we have in the world today. And when you think about in the United States, you know, in 2005 we passed a bill to help the nuclear industry, you know, uh, uh, meet the U.S. government would give them get loan guarantees for liability and so therefore, you know, we get some plants built. I mean, we've added like one plant since 2005 and it's not even finished yet, right? So my point to you is the scale up of what we're talking about is so large right, that it's, it's, not, it's not something we're doing in a five or 10 year horizon, right? And, and we have to think about how we're going to do it, right? And it's not going to happen by itself, right? It's going to take some government intervention, and it means that we citizens have to be engaged in the process. And, and some of that, I see a lot of potential with this younger generation. Uh, and I feel very optimistic when I go around the campus here at UC Davis because people have to be willing to have a different lifestyle, you know, live locally, right? I mean, we don't need to be drinking bottled water from New Zealand, right? It's not necessary. When I was a kid, fruit was out of season. You couldn't have that kind of fruit that was back in season. There was no putting it in a, a, a freezer unit and having it shipped from Chile, right? And, and, and maybe some of the things we've done to enhance our, our recreational lifestyle, you know, whether it's with these foods from around the world or products from around the world, um, maybe some of that needs to pass by the wayside. And maybe we need to look at, you know, what are the energy consequences of using so much? Um, and then some of it has to do with really having more and more people. Uh, you're good at math. You know, instead of going to Wall Street and developing a derivative product that will mean that your grandmother is going to wind up without her pension, maybe you should use that math skill to, you know, develop a better widget for using energy or for producing energy, right? So we need a little, we need more people to go into science and technology and engineering, and we need to use a little bit, be a little less wasteful in uh, the kinds of things we demand as consumers. Well, Amy, uh, we, we're thrilled to have you here at the University of California, Davis, and uh, we're looking forward to the great work that you're going to do. And uh, we know that uh, the, the university community, the policy community, the business community is going to benefit a great deal from uh, your involvement and your leadership role here at UC Davis. Well, I'm excited to be here, and I'm looking forward to working with everyone here. So thank you today for joining us with this dialogue uh, with Amy Jaffe, our new Executive Director of Energy and Sustainability at UC Davis.